Hey, boys and girls, we're back! And, um, I didn't bring my save file with me tonight, so we won't be able to make any changes to our permanent record. Uh, I just put my combat skill and endurance in here, and we know what disciplines we have, and if we get any special items or something, we shall just have to remember to mark them on the permanent record later. I say we, but really I mean me, because... You know, it's not your responsibility, it's mine! Um, <laughs> and I forgot my USB. That's alright! That's alright! We're gonna do this, because I did not want to delay this anymore. Uh, we've got, we've got lore stones to find, and, uh, and nobles to talk to. Though I still don't know how I know they're nobles, but still! Talk to them, we must. Alright, um... Uh, if you have the magic, I just want to sign a screen. Oh, right, that's right, because because in this book, my mind is like an open flea market. A wave of psychic energy rushes through your mind, washing across your thoughts, searching for some sign of hostile intent. You resist the intrusion, and the wave quickly recedes. Apparently, they did not find what they wanted at the flea market. With a gesture of his hand, Lorcon Ironheart dismisses the scouts, and you are left alone in his company. So, you are the, uh, Aeonian. <laughs> Aeonian. Uh, uh, of, for whom Mistress S S Soroka would have me postpone my war against chaos, he says sardonically, reaching for a decanter of ruby red wine. He fills two crystal goblets and offers one to you. Let us toast the success, the success of your treasure hunt, he says, raising his glass high. Good lord. I just started, and I can't even read a single word. Anyway, we have a picture of him, of good old Ironheart there. And to your triumph over chaos, you add diplomatically. He smiles as he sips the bitter vintage, and you regard each other with thoughtful curiosity. He has a youthful face, with high cheekbones, a narrow jaw, and a thin, chiseled, aristocratic nose. His silver hair is a mass of silken threads flowing from beneath the rim of his ornate, conical helmet to fan across his wide shoulders and thick, vermilion cloak. But it is his eyes that fascinate you the most, for they are filled with knowledge and ancient wisdom. I thought you said they were filled with blue mist and no pupils. Which is it? Make up your mind, lone wolf. <laughs> like what? Why are you looking at my eyes? They're filled with with knowledge and is that? Yes it is. Wisdom. Ha <laughs> there it is. It just floated across your eyes right there. Alright, um you talk at length about events which have brought you to the Nagoth Forest in your search for Lorcon's help. And in return he tells you of the dangers you may face in the uh Tolakos. I may face at Holocaust. From a gold-capped leather tube, Lorcon produces a map of North Nagath, which details the location of his encampment, the burial grounds of Tolakos, and the last known position of the Chaos Master's Horde. The scale is measured in leagues, but you are able to calculate that uh, Tolakos lies only 10 miles from Lorcon's camp. A curvy red line has been drawn diagonally across the map, showing where the scouts last sighted the Chaos Master's troops, and this line presses dangerous, passes dangerously close to the burial grounds. You must leave as soon as possible if you are to be sure of reaching uh, Tolakos before it is claimed by the enemy, says Lorcon pointing to the bold red line. This was drawn three days ago, or three hours ago. <laughs> Slight difference there. Three hours ago. If the Chaos Master decides to advance, he is within eight hours march of the burial grounds. This means that in only the next five hours can you be sure to find uh, Tolokos unoccupied. I intend to march my army forward and hold Tolokos, but I await reinforcements and I dare not move until they arrive. Therefore, I will provide you with the scout who knows the area well. He will guide you to your destination. The rest is up to you. Oh, oh, oh Lorcan, I am sorry, but I'm pretty sure he'll die. Uh, pretty much any time you send someone with me, it doesn't end well. <laughs> Lorcon sends the scout for the scout and the uh, Melodorian called Odell. When he arrives, he suggests that you visit the equipment tent before setting off through the forest. If you wish to take the opportunity and select some new equipment before venturing to Tolokos, yeah, I need more arrows. 
Luck be with you, uh, Ananian, says Lorcan, uh, Lorcan, as you turn to leave his cabin. Remember, I will be marching to Telecos as soon as my reinforcements arrive. You thank him and bid him farewell before following Odell to the, uh, the scout as he winds his way through the busy encampment to the equipment tent. Two grim-faced guards bar your entry, but when Odell tells them uh, whose authority you are here, they quickly lower their spears and allow you to pass. Darn right. I'm VIP, bitches. Alright, um, the tent is full of weapons and provisions, and Odell suggests that you take whatever you need. You may select from the following. A sword, a spear, a mace, a dagger, six arrows, a bow, a quiver, a backpack, a quarterstaff, a short sword. And three dancing women. I don't know why they're there. I don't see how they could possibly help me with this. I, I guess maybe I could distract them. That they would look the dance and then run. But I don't know why they're listed as equipment. Dancing women, that's just... That's... Okay, I'm kidding. There's, there's no dancing women, people. There's no dancing women. Uh, oh, I gotta put this here. I think I had like three arrows. Well, anyway, there's six arrows, so I can just take whatever I need. So I have six arrows. And you know what? I'm taking the dancing women. I'm taking them. Yeah, I'm gonna put them right here in my backpack. Dancing women. Dot 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 dot. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. There's no. There's no. There's no. There's no dancing women. I, I can't put them in my backpack. Even if they were there, they would not fit in my backpack unless they're very tiny, tiny dancing women. <laughs> All right, um, what were we talking about? Oh, crap, I don't remember what's in my backpack. I don't know how many meals I have, etc., etc., whatever. Unimportant, I tell you. All right, Odell replenishes a quiver of bolts that he carries in his hip and checks that the crossbow he wears strapped to his forearm is functioning properly. Satisfied, he falls away the hinged bow at arms and slips a brace of throwing knives into the tops of his boots. Are you ready? He asks as you finish adjusting your equipment. Yes, you reply confidently. Let's go! Uh, Odell, if I were you though, I would probably say goodbye to your family because, look, I'm just saying, it doesn't usually end well for people that come with me or who are assigned to go with me. And guys, I don't I don't remember what happens to Odell, but come on, guys. Come on. You've, you've been through this series with me enough to know usually does not end well for them. <laughs> the only guy I remember, besides Bainden, who obviously is a main character that knows everyone under the sun, the only character I can remember that has ever been sent with Lone Wolf and survived the adventure was uh, Pido in the eighth book. And if you remember correctly, at the end of the last book, we left him in a room with the Dark Lord, Nag. So, yeah. I don't think his future is looking too bright. <laughs> Anyway, Odell, I'm sure it'll be fine. Come on, let's go. You leave the encampment by slipping over the perimeter wall and quickly merge like shadows into the thick forest beyond. The giant trunks support a canopy of dense foliage that blocks out most of the light and keeps the forest floor bathed in a perpetual twilight. A carpet of moss muffles your footfalls, and the only foliage that grows in abundance is a bushy velvet lichen patterned with orange-headed uh, tooth-sized growths. Yeah. If you possess the magnetic eye discipline of curing, I do actually. You sense immediately the tiny orange growths are poisonous spore pods. If swallowed, or if the spores are allowed to inflict, inflict the bloodstream, the toxin can be killed in a matter of minutes. If you wish to collect a handful of these spores and mark them on your action chart as a backpack item, uh, sure, why not? Never know how many to poison people. Uh, I'm sure I had at least one spot open in my backpack, so I don't think this is a problem. Alright. Alright, uh, 247. Alright. The cool gloom of the Nagoth forest floor seems to continue indefinitely. Then you arrive at a place where one of the massive trees has fallen and torn a gap in the canopy of leaves. The gloom, there the gloom is brightened by a narrow column of light. This is Balin's Bar whispers Odell, pointing to a decaying trunk. Just another league, and we'll be at Tolokos. If you have the Magna Guide Discipline of Pathmanship, and have reached the rank of tutelary or more, and I have, I most certainly have, you feel the familiar chill of premonition as your Kai senses alert you to a tiny pair of eyes blinking in the gloom of the leafy canopy overhead. You sense that a hostile creature lurks there, waiting to fire at anything that comes within range of its lethal blowpipe. If you have a bow and wish to use it, I do have a bow, and yes, 
Yes, I do wish to use it. Thank you for asking. Uh, with consummate accuracy, you send an arrow whistling into the treetops. God, I don't even have to choose a random number table on this. <laughs> it ends its flight buried feather deep in the scaly abdomen of an agath sniper. The beast gives a piercing shriek and tumbles to the ground, landing with a sickening thud near the base of Balin's bar. Odell praises your skill and rushes forward, half crouched, to search the chaos creature's body. If you wish to stay where you are and cover him with your bow. Yeah, sure. Let's do that. Let's be safe. Cover with the bow. You scan the surrounding trees, your eyes peeled for the slightest hint of another enemy. While Odell examines the dead ag uh, Agath. Uh, Agta. 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 That's so weird. Why can't you just name them like orcs? <laughs> the Agta. He shakes his head, indicating that he is just he has found nothing of interest and beckons you onward. Just as you begin to move, you catch sight of a gray shape scurrying away into the misty distance. Quickly you draw an arrow and take aim, but the creature is no longer there. It has melted into the shadows. Alright, I have five arrows left. There is a moment of cold fear when you first set eyes on the burial grounds of Talakos. An eerie blue glow, cast by clumps of bacterial fungi, illuminates a mist that sweeps from the tombs and crypts of this ancient necropolis. The swirling vapor is contained by a wall which encircles the graveyard, although it is broken in many places where the trees have displaced the moldering stonework. With a weapon at the ready, you follow Odell towards one such gap in the wall, which is overshadowed by a great mausoleum. This is the vault of Sidron, whispers Odell. He clambers over the rubble and crouches beside the damp gray wall. Old King Kalen sleeps here. He removes a throwing knife from his boot, and with a tip he points to the other funeral landmarks of Tolokos and, and identifies them one by one. That is the crypt of Juliar. Over there, the graves of the faithful. And there, Balin's tomb. The Chaos Master and his minions have kept us away from here for nearly a generation, but Lorcan is determined to wrest it away from him and restore it to its past glory. Over there, near the center, is the Grand Sepulchre. That's where the bloodline of the Ironheart clan is, are laid to rest. <clears throat> Excuse me. You stare at this Mechabear building and a powerful feeling electrifies your body. The Sepulchre is an imposing sight, yet it is not the grim splendor of the design that exhilarates you. You are ablaze with the realization that somewhere here in the Grand Sepulchre of the Ironhearts lie the t last two lore stones the, of Nexitar. The objects of your quest. Woohoo! I must search that tomb, you stay staring fixedly at the huge door that dominates the sepulchre's blue gray sculptured facade. Odell frowns and casts his eyes nervously at the surrounding mist. I cannot enter, he says. I am not of clan blood. If you choose to go through that door, you must go alone. You sense that nothing will induce Odell to break his clan law, but you are anxious not to lose a valuable guide. When I enter the Grand Sepulchre, will you wait for me here? You ask, hoping he will agree. Silently, he considers your request. Yes, he says, without enthusiasm. But search swiftly. The creatures of chaos are close. I can feel it in my blood. You exchange stern smiles and hurry away through the knee-deep mist towards the great door. The portal is secured by a massive metallic lock, and engraved into its blackened surface is a quartered square. The th in three of the four quarters, are the etched symbols, but in the fourth quarter, which is formed by a soft clay-like substance, remains blank. Your basic Kai instincts tell you that the symbols are a clue to a uh, Melodorian code that unlocks the great door. By inscribing the correct symbols on the soft surface of the blank square, you will cause the portal to open. Study the sequence carefully. Okay, hang on. Uh, if you possess the magnet guide to similar pathmanship or divination... Alright, let's turn to one page 116. Maybe they'll just let us bypass it. Your sense is warned that the powerful spell protects this portal. If you inscribe the wrong symbol, the blank square will break the spell. The consequences which could be fatal. Uh-oh. Oops. <laughs> uh, below are shown four groups of symbols. Only one which is correct. The group, uh, One group, when inscribed on the blank square, will open the lock that secures the great door. Study the symbols carefully and compare them with the other three groups in the illustration accompanying the entry 131. When you think you have found the group of symbols that completes the sequence of four, uh, turn to the entry given below. Alright, so we go here. We have one 
empty triangle and an empty circle, and then we have two empty circles and a full triangle, and then a full triangle and an empty circle. Well, crud. Um, well, let's take a look at our choices. You have a triangle and two empty squares. Uh, okay, hang on. Alright, I just took a quick picture of the other ones. So I don't have to keep flipping back and forth. So, let's see. We have a blank square triangle, a blank circle, then two blank circles, and a full triangle. And then the choices are... Hmm... Well, that's a tough one, actually. Let's see. Uh. Um. <laughs> um, well, you see. I, hang on. You guys try and figure it out, too. Well, to be honest, I'm a little lost. Um, sorry, I was sitting there thinking about it for about 30 seconds or so. Uh considering different patterns it's not I'm pretty sure it's not B because there's no reason for it to just repeat itself down here there's no I mean there's no pattern there um, I don't I don't know I don't know a I mean I'm trying to think of is it a progressive pattern like it goes here then here then here then here that one I don't think so because I don't think it makes sense um, the only thing that I've picked up that kind of makes sense is the crosswise, this one and this one, are exactly the same except that the triangle is filled in down here. Now, if we look at it the other crossways, there's uh, um, this with the two circles and the filled triangle, and then this one, two circles and a blank triangle. That would kind of match, like, you know, same picture with empty and full triangle, same picture with empty and full triangle. So, uh, I'm thinking C, but gosh, that is such a flimsy... I mean, ah, oh. but I don't see anything else that would logically make sense as sort of any progression or opposite or anything. I mean, it can't be A, because, you know, even if I went with the same route, you know, these two switch places, but these two don't switch places, so this C, I think it's C. I'm going to go with C, and hopefully I won't die. Don't save. All right. A soft whirling noise emanates from the inside the lock. When silently and effortlessly the great portal swings open. Oh, thank God. Alright, I was expecting to get a fireball to the face. Uh, with your nerves on edge, you enter the dark interior and follow a featureless corridor to another large but less impressive door, which opens as you approach. A surge of damp air whips past you, sucked into the chamber beyond. As the airtight seal is broken after many decades, torches ignite uh, spontaneously. And for the first time in its long history, the secrets of the inner sanctum of the Great Sepulchre are revealed to the eyes of a, a, a Aeonian. Uh, Aeonian. At the center of the chamber stands a statue of a proud Melodorian warrior, clad in battle dress and with his sword raised in challenge. Seven closed caskets lie at his feet, with seven more beside them, open and empty, awaiting future generations of the Ironheart clan. Here you can sense the presence of the lower stones more strongly. Your skin tingles and your pulse begins to race. But despite your reactions, you can tell that they lie not within this chamber, but somewhere nearby. Behind the tall structure, you discover a narrow stale, stair that ascends the to a circular portal uh, in the ceiling. Close, close to the foot of the stairs is an arched door sparkling, of sparkling blue metal. If you possess the Summer Sword... I do. I do possess the Summer Sword. Gently, the Summer Sword vibrates in its scabbard and a cool golden fire laps at the hilt. Instinctively, you unsheath it and immediately the blade is engulfed by golden flames ignited by the close proximity of the lower stones. As you raise the sword, the flames burn brighter and illuminate the circular portal at the ce uh, in the ceiling. At once you realize that it must provide access to the roof of the sepulchre, and with your heart pounding, you race up the steps, confident of finding the objects of your quest waiting for you there. Yay! 
A lever operates the portal, and when you pull it, the circular hatch cracks, uh, creaks open, and a shaft of gray light washes over you, he over your head and shoulders. You senses your senses burn with expectation. You grip the rim and start to pull yourself through the hole, but a dark shadow and a cold wind sweep over you, making you flinch and fall back on the stairs. There is a loud crack, like a sharp clap of thunder, and a terrible scream of agony echoes through the forest. Fear and anger grip your senses as you realize that you have just heard the dying scream of Ardell, your guide. Yeah, well, they didn't see that coming, right? <laughs> oh, poor Ardell. Alright, enraged! You Why? Why enraged? You should expect this kind of thing. <laughs> I'm kidding. Enraged, you leap for the portal and pull yourself to onto the roof where the lower stones and an unexpected enemy await you. Perched on a bra overhanging the roof is a gigantic black-winged bird. Seated on its back is a magnificent warrior dressed in scarlet silk and polished silver mail. His head is crowned by an elaborate helmet, his, its visor formed in the shape of a roaring dragon with jeweled eyes and fiery breath. The tangled branches prevent the bird from landing, but a rope ladder hangs from the, its saddle and the warrior uses it to climb down onto the roof. He leaps the last few feet, and his landing disturbs the dense mist that carpets the surface, rolling it back to reveal two glowing golden spheres of crystal, each filled with fire lying close to where he now stands. He crouches down, and your stomach churns with dread as you see him reach out to grab the golden lore stones. And then we have a picture of this finely dressed warrior reaching out to grab my crystal balls. Alright, um, yeah, you heard me. If you have a bow and wish to fire at the warrior, if you wish to draw a hand weapon and attack him, if you wish to command him, no, he's already killed my guide, so I'm pretty sure talking's not really, uh, um, well, I should still tell him no. So, yeah. Don't touch my lore stones, punk. The warrior answers your demand with a mocking laugh. His green, cat-like eyes glint through the slits of his visor. Yeah, I figured that was going to happen. But oh well. He hurriedly he snatches the lore stones with his gloved hands and drops them into a small velvet sack tied to a sword belt. Angered by his audacity and fearful of losing the lore stones, you unsheath a weapon and run forward, determined to prevent his escape. Page 22. For his size, the warrior is quick as a cat. As you approach, he draws a curved, curvy blade at curvy curvy bladed sword and prepares to greet you with its razor sharp edge. You strike first, aiming a blow at his head, but he dodges it and moves continuous, continually, presenting you with a hard target to hit. You strike again and this time he pans uh, your blow and turns it back with such strength that you are sent reeling to the edge of the roof. Alrighty. Now, I had my summer sword out, so I'm just going to keep using my summer sword because that just seems to make sense. I mean, I mean, I had it drawn in the first place. Uh, you know, to find the lore stone. So, uh, my combat skills are 36 at the moment. Mm. No, actually, it would be at 38 because it doesn't say I can't use Mind Blast. So, his combat skill is 29, endurance 38. If you reduce his endurance to 20 points or less, do not continue. If you kill him before his endurance falls to 20 points, um, uh, okay. So, his combat skill is 29. His endurance is 38. Let's do this. Come on. What? Oh, right. Oops. There we go. Start the combat. Let's get it on. Um, enemy took 10 damage. I took 2. So he's down to 28. Okay. Uh, he's down to 18. I took another two. I'm down to 36. What? What happened? What? My my computer did something. Oh, I I defeated my enemy. That's what happened. Uh, wait, what? Oh, okay, I instant killed him the third time. But it said to stop after 20. All right, so we'll stop after 20. Breathless and bleeding, the warrior evades your skillful attacks by leaping for the rope ladder and holding fast. From there, he shouts a command and the giant blackbird takes off into the air, lifting him off the roof. A wave of panic engulfs you, and desperation, in desperation you leap up and strike a blow at the velvet sacks, swinging from his belt. 
He tries to fend off your attack, but his position is precarious. Your blow strikes home, slitting open the velvet and gashing a, uh, deep into the back of his gloved hand. He drops his sword, and one of the two lore stones tumbles from the sack and falls to the graveyard below, coming to rest close to the door of the sepulchre. Yet he manages to save the second lore stone from falling, and with a parting curse, you watch as he is lifted into the s above the trees and carried away into the cold gray sky. Well, that sucks. Peering over the parapet, you try to locate the lore stone, but it is impossible to see through the eerie blue carpet of gray mist. You are about to leave the roof when you hear the thrumming noise, like the sound of a wild and discordant, dis discordant drumming. You peer in the direction of the noise and see a line of hulking shapes shambling towards the gaps in the perimeter wall. Instantly you recognize them. They are the Akta, the hideous creations of the Chaos Master. Spurred on by anger and fear, you race through the inner sanctum the sepulchre and of the sepulchre and skid to a halt outside its great door. There, shrouded in mist, you discover the body of your guide, his chest torn open and blackened by a bolt of power that claimed his life. You kneel to close his sightless eyes and immediately sense the lower stone is close at hand. Guided by instinct, you race towards the lower stone, but as you are running past the entrance of the crypt, you are set upon by a pair of snarling chaos creatures. Well, I have gained one health point back, so... Yay! You are in combat with two Actash scouts who are determined to fight you to the death. You know what? I'm just going to keep using the summer sword because I already have it drawn out and, you know... Whatever. Let's do it. I already think that Lone Wolf's so pissed off and desperate right now that he wouldn't bother to change another sword. You just keep using the one in his hand. <laughs> uh, these creatures are immune to mind bass, blast, but not psi search, so I'm back down to 36 health. Yeah, hit combat skill. If you possess the Magna Guide Discipline of Hunt Mastery, unless you possess the Magna Guide Discipline of Hunt Mastery, reduce your combat skill by three points for the first two rounds, owing to the surprise of their attack. But I have Hunt Mastery, so I don't have to worry about that. Alright, so they are at 26 combat skill and 21 endurance. We are fighting out! Uh, my combat ratio is 10, my random number is 6. The enemy took 14 damage and now has 7 endurance points. I took 1 damage. The enemy is dead! And I only took one point of damage. Good job. Good job, Lone Wolf. Way to show them who's boss. You leap over their bodies of the dead Akta and press on with your search. Ahead you see a glimmer of gold and the pale blue luminescence and you thrust your hand towards it into the mist. A tingling sensation runs the length of your arm, filling your body with an incredible sense of strength and well-being as you close your hand around the lore stone and hold it up before your eyes. Restore your endurance points to the original level. Okay. Fair enough. It's... The golden glow fades as the wisdom contained within the lower stone is infused into your being. The wisdom! I can feel it! I am becoming wiser! Alright, uh... Your spirit soars, but you do not allow your euphoria to blind you to the danger that is closing on Tolikos. You turn and run back towards the entrance of the Grand Sepulchre, intending to seek sanctuary behind its door, but your foot catches on something sharp and sends you sprawling to the ground. The toe of your left boot is cut through, but fortunately your foot has escaped without a scratch. Cautiously, you try to locate what caused such a vicious cut and discover the Scarlet Warrior's curvy bladed sword. You wish to keep this weapon? No? No, I don't need it. Thank you, though. I'm good. Okay. Uh, you grab the jeweled hilt and are about to hurl it away when you notice that its curvy blade is engraved with a spectacular fiery dragon. At once you recognize the design and your hopes of retrieving the last lore stone are suddenly revived. It is the identical to the symbol you first saw on the table of visions. The mark that embolized the stone gate of Hagadar. You focus your Kai skills on the blade and they confirm your suspicions. The Scarlet Warrior came from Hagadar and it is to the distant city that his black winged mount is now returning with the lore, last lore stone of the Kai. Well, that'll make things convenient, won't it? From the depths of the Nagath Forest crawls a nightmare army of gibbering 
chaos or gibbering chaos creatures. They are directed by one sinister being, and all are obedient to his silent command. You run towards the sepulchre with terror in your heart as their withering shapes pour through the gaps of the perimeter wall in ever-increasing numbers. You evade their spears and stones, but as you reach the great door, you are confronted by three tentacled horrors, wearing heavy armor strapped to their warty hides. Their bloated bodies fill the doorway and prevent you from entering. And you are but a small, cute anime girl. This is not going to end well for you. <laughs> okay, sorry. If you have the magic guide to splinter divination, hunt mastery, or pathmanship, I do. Your senses tell you that Lorcan, uh, Lorcan Ironheart's army is within a league of Telecos and will be here within the hour. Until then, you must find somewhere safe from the Chaos Horde, or you will be overwhelmed and destroyed by the sheer weight of numbers. Quickly, you scan the surrounding crypts and note that, with the exception of the Grand Sepulchre and Babylon's tomb, they are all in a state of ruin. If you wish to attack the chaos creatures that are blocking the entrance to the Grand Sepulchre, if you wish to run to the Babylon Tomb... No, let's just kill these guys and get in here. We don't have time to run to somewhere else. The three creatures bellow and growl as your blows find their way between their plates of armor, and they retaliate by lashing you with their sucker tentacles. Their attacks are ill-aimed and clumsy, but whenever one of their blubbery limbs touches your body, it leaves an angry red will. Alright, combat skill 12, endurance 43, unless you possess the magnetic discipline of curing, which I do, and have reached the rank of mentor or more, which I do have, add 2 to any endurance points you lose to stay in combat owing to the poisonous effects of their tentacles. Alright. Let's see, uh, so, okay, they have, I have 40 hit points, I'm still using my Summer Sword, no reason not to, oh, and they are not immune to my, well, it doesn't matter, I have a combat skill of 12, I'm already gonna have the max combat chart I can have, so, 43, let's get it on! Uh, they took 18 points of damage, I took 0, sweet, they took 5, I took 1, they're dead, I only took 1 point of damage, woohoo! Hooray for our side! And the Summer Sword. And I tell you, most powerful artifact in the game. Saves your butt. As the last of your foul enemies falls dead at your feet, you sheathe your weapon and drag their blood-spattered corpses away from the great door. Then you push close the heavy portal, making sure that it is secure before climbing the stair to the roof. As you look down from the parapet, you are greeted by a stirring sight. Lorcan Ironheart's army is surging into Telocos, uh, Telocos. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Either he moves incredibly fast, or I was fighting those three tentacled monsters for an ungodly amount of time. They said be there within the hour. <laughs> I was like sitting there fighting them for like 46 minutes, like, oh my god, die. <laughs> 